why NZ On Air does transmedia. At NZ On Air, we fund diverse New Zealand content. We fund television, music, radio, community broadcasting, and uh, more recently, digital media. And the idea is that we have, with digital media funding, a very strong focus on audiences. And we want to make people think uh, a little bit, well, within the digital strategy, we want people to engage with content, we want people to be able to find content, and we want to be able to think a little bit past tally on the web. So we're not taking digital with an NZ on air as being like House of Cards on TV. We're talking about something that is a little bit more pushing it. We use digital media to reach specific audiences, and part of that is understanding how the audiences are using the digital platforms that we have. And as it turns out, they're actually using them quite a lot. So an example of a, a transmedia project that we funded is the Factory Story. Has anybody seen that or heard of that one? Cool. Um, our focus a couple of years ago with this fund, with digital media funding, was on Pacific Island audiences. It turns out that's one of the biggest, largest groups um, of users of mobile data, particularly in um, Auckland. And so we wanted to target their projects towards audiences that weren't being best served by mainstream media and we've chosen different pockets of audiences at different times. And this particular um, project started out as a quite a successful stage play. It got evolved into an idea for a web series but in creating the web series concept the people um, took a brightly coloured bus and they took that bus into the communities around Auckland and they auditioned for actors to be in the series. They asked, canvassed for songs and ideas and storylines and jokes to be included. They got people to vote on who would be from the auditions. They then put up um, videos and blogs of people. They got people to vote on who would be included in the series. And then they put the series together and they were publishing that. At the same time, the characters had Facebook profiles and they had blogs and, and so on. And actually... I think this was a really successful uh, series. It reached over 250,000 um, people and with a specific Pacific Island audience that was actually uh, really engaged on social media that was talking about it a lot. And I think in that, in that sense it worked quite well. The other project that year was the CocoNet, um, and CocoNet TV is a hub for Pacific Island content. And this is it is transmedia, it's not so much a project that has a lot of different interlocking pieces, but it's a place that brings together content that people submit, so there's a sort of a travel log, Pacific Islanders around the world submitting in stories of where they live and where they've been. There's a, a Know Your Roots, a sort of an interactive timeline of um, events that have happened throughout different Pacific Islands. There are a whole series of how-to videos, um, like how to tie a lava lava, how to dodge a flying jandal, how to make an umu, how, sort of a mixture of comedy and, and quite serious stuff. And increasingly, there's a really, really strong social media component to this. So most of the things, visits that these guys get, they're getting 40 or 50,000 visits a month. Uh, through their Facebook page and through their YouTube channel and those videos are shared massively and talked about and commented on massively specifically by the Pacific Island community in New Zealand and around the world. A uh, project that actually launched this week, um, which you... Has anybody heard of this one? Whew! <laughs> This is on um, in association with stuff, basically, and this is a nice example of a, a transmedia project. It's got a central thread, which is the story of these two characters, and they travel from Invercargill to uh, right up to Cape Reinga. So the story is they uh, have to drive a car up the country. That's the central thread. There's their relationship and the dynamic between these two. But the, she is a uh, Canadian um, journalism student and her desire on this road trip is to find stories of interesting New Zealanders and sort of find out more about New Zealand and its characters. So through stuff they ran a, a car, a, like a, um, not a competition, but a, asked readers to submit ideas. What ideas? Who should we go and visit? You know, tell us what, who should we see what stories are interesting around New Zealand. And they got hundreds of things submitted. They then asked people to vote on the best ideas. They narrowed it down, and they've chosen nine different locations around New Zealand on the course of this road trip. Um, so they've woven the interviews with these various characters. So, for example, there is a um, yesterday's episode had this 
quite out there kind of burlesque performance show thing happening in Christchurch. And the characters, in, in the character of them being on the road trip, went and interviewed the person doing the show, went to the show, it's talked about the show, it's kind of woven into their narrative as they go up. And then today's episode will have somebody in Hokitika, um, tomorrow's episode somebody else. So they're sort of weaving these different stories, plus there were radio interviews. There's a whole lot of backstories. They can only take little pieces in the actual web episode. So on the Tumblr, there's a whole backstory, the, the full sort of burlesque performance and the extra links to all the information and the interviews is all happening on Tumblr and there are pictures of the thing on Instagram. Um, there are quite a lot of interactions still happening with this on social media as well. And it's, it's, it's sort of also bringing the communities, as they've passed through these communities and told these stories, they're getting all those people involved in the community access radio people have done interviews, they are talking about it, the ones that they've interviewed are talking about it. It's got some quite nice little elements to it. Um, if you have a look on stuff, it's actually an episode a day for this week and next week. Has anybody heard of this one? This is an international example. Um, this is a really nice project. So this was uh, created by somebody who, um, you know, wanted to honour Johnny Cash. And the, the music video for this song, Ain't No Grave, uh, all, each of the frames of the music video were available, made available online, and you could download you could, one of the frames and you could colorize it or, or design it or tailor it however you wanted to do. You recorded a little video of yourself with your story about why Johnny Cash is important to you, what he's meant in your life or why you love that song, and you uploaded your frame plus your little video and your little bio of yourself, and this site, when you watch the video, it compiles randomly a frame, each one of those frames from all of the millions of frames that were submitted from everybody. So each time you watch the video you get a different sequence of the frames of the video and you can stop it at any point, click on a frame and go and see who submitted that one and why Johnny Cash was important to them. And I haven't like included all of these to run to show you because it would take too long but uh, this one is actually really cool to go and watch and it's amazing that every time you get a different experience when you stop the video you can see the list of the 50 different versions of that particular frame. You can click on any one of them and see why anybody's chosen that one and what they've done with it. Another um, transmedia project is quite a classic one that's been around uh, a few years now and I heard about this from Jeff Gomez who's a transmedia producer from the States that, that came to New Zealand and ran a workshop recently. The Lizzie Bennett Diaries is a multi-platform adaptation of Pride and Prejudice and it reimagines this Jane Austen classic as a blog filmed in the bedroom of a 24-year-old student. There are over 100 YouTube episodes and there are a number of additional videos where characters are engaging with um, questions or answering questions from different people who've submitted comments or have questions and in, in interviews. The side characters in this have had spin-off video blogs and blogs of their own sort of like stories as well. So there's a whole connection, connected network of stories and blogs associated with it. And the people, the producers ran a, a Kickstarter campaign to make a few more episodes um, and to or actually to create DVDs of the series. And they reached their goal within six hours and the money just kept coming in and the people submitting were saying, use the money, make more episodes, we want more of this, we love this so much, we just keep making more of it. And ironically, it's now actually a book. So <laughs> it's kind of come full circle. But I mean, that's a, a really lovely example of something transmedia. So why do this and why would you bother? I think. Aside from the possibilities that you get and the exciting opportunities that the internet in particular gives us to extend you know, a project, it's about moving with the times and in reference back to the to pictures at the beginning of the way that people behave, audiences actually expect there to be more these days. They want to be able to access or watch content whenever and wherever they like. They want to be able to talk about it. They might even feel like they're entitled to influence it. They like to choose the device that they have. They uh, like to choose their, their degree of engagement, if you like, and they expect responsiveness. So you kind of got to be there. You've got to do what people want you to do, if you want the people. 
Also, it opens up new opportunities for producers um, to get direct involvement and even direction from audiences. And some of the interactions that, that producers get are quite unexpected and they can take stories in ways that they hadn't anticipated. So there's an element of you know, wonder or opportunity and delight in there that can come from not knowing what's going to happen. Um, Creatives get to try new things. There's a sort of new forms of artistic expression. You can you can relatively low risk try something out. You can take it in whatever di direction you want. You can bring it back and stop it if it doesn't work. Um, you can break the sort of established frameworks that and change definitions of the way things should work. So it's kind of a limitless possibility. At the same time, bound by your budget, bound by audience interaction, and bound by you know choosing something that's right for the story that you have. But being everywhere means newer and bigger audiences as well. And you have the opportunity to have an audience on one platform and take them with you to the next one, to be everywhere. Um, there are opportunities for new business models as well, more platforms, bigger audiences, more potential. Uh, I won't deny that there is actually no tried and true way of making money off these things. It, it's a little bit, it's not so much hit and miss. Great things will, will be successful and sometimes great things won't be if they don't find their audiences. Um, that's because finding audiences is the biggest challenge of any of these online things. Um, so loyal audiences uh, that you take with you also talk about you, also share your messages, also bring people and their friends and their contacts into the things that you're doing. I want to close actually with this vaguely related story. Um, this is a TED talk and this is a Nigerian author, uh, a novelist, and I won't try and pronounce her name, but she has this amazing talk about the danger of a single story. She talks about growing up in Nigeria uh, in a, you know, uh, reasonably, um, not, not like a middle class Nigerian family, where she had, where she uh, read about, she read books that were by British and American authors. And so her experience of literature and her experience of um, the world that books gave her was of, uh, talking about white children drinking ginger beer, talking about the weather, um, and having this whole set of kind of experiences that meant nothing to her. So in her head, this was what white people were. This is, what, this is a world that existed only in literature. When she f later discovered African writers and discovered sort of alternative views, that she found her culture reflected in that literature, and she found a way to express her sort of authentic cultural voice. And in this talk, she highlights several examples in her life where just having one perspective really limits your ability to see the potential of the world um, and to see opportunities. I recommend you watch this talk. It's got kind of nothing to do with transmedia, but the idea is that, that transmedia allows you to progress beyond a single story and to see different points of view and to explore different perspectives or aspects. It's quite a new world. It's, re it's quite exciting. Um, it's quite relevant. And I suggest you get out there and do it. That's me. Five minutes for questions. Suck that much, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Brenda. Um, the transmedia accessing different stories from around the slide that you finished on, in the context of content that's being um, created, do you think that people are engaging cross culturally more? Or is it actually that? that content's been created specifically for smaller cultural groups and done people accessing it. It's not actually, you know, are New Zealand children accessing Nigerian content, for example? You know, do you think that the world will go that way or are we still actually looking for our own stories? Um, <laughs> I think that the fact that these things are online means that the possibility for everyone to access them is enhanced. But say, for example, with the Pacific Island features that we funded recently, 
our goal was to get content that was relevant and, and you know, useful or of interest to Pacific Islanders. There was a big sort of peripheral audience around that that saw things that they hadn't seen before. Nobody had seen a, a drama comedy series entirely made up of Pacific Island characters and even Pacific Islanders were watching it were going like, oh my God, everybody's brown and there's no drugs and there's no cops. You know, like it was, it was, it was a lovely, great story, yeah. And, and that is an opportunity to share those kind of like the, the wonderful stories and the breadth of stories with different cultures but I honestly don't know other than I think the internet makes it possible um, I was just wondering from New Zealand and Ed's perspective whether there's any kind of minimum threshold of the on-air uh, component to the interest in transmedia so for example if there was a very site specific kind of community oriented project that did have an online element or a video element um, would they consider kind of funding all aspects of that or yeah um, no, the digital fund is completely not bound by broadcast. Uh, it doesn't need to have a broadcast outcome. Digital yeah, and there, there are certainly, it could also be in real life. Is it? I mean, there, there's a sort of an interesting um, crossover from theatre or performance art into digital. There does have to be a digital element, and we need to. There's a sort of an area where is this creative New Zealand's um, business, or is this NZ on Air's business, or is this you know like there's a a little bit of a, a grey area around that, but we certainly, as long as it all comes together in a good way, it's something that gets considered. Yep. Hi, um, I was wondering what you, um, when you talk about transmedia, are you mainly thinking of things that are initiated from a centre, like a TV show, that then um, sets up side projects that are interactive? Uh, and to what extent transmedia also involves um, a periphery in which you have an authorised, I'm thinking of something like uh, fan fiction, that sort of thing online, um, that, that it's a case of people being prepared to open up their project and let other people do things with it. I actually think that uh, what really happens because primarily of financial constraints in an ideal scenario, a transmedia project is not started with an, a broadcast, a TV series or a film or something like that. In an ideal world, it starts with an idea, a story world, and all the different producers sit at the table and they say, where are all our, you know, how are our different projects going to come together and where, where do they intersect? There may or may not be a series component to it or a documentary or a film. Um, it could certainly be the, something that somebody is opening up, like you say, and shaping in a different direction. Um, but what I've realised is that every single project is going to handle this slightly differently and going to come together very differently. But what everybody really needs is the core of a really good idea and needs to understand how their audiences are going to find it and where their audiences are. And that's actually the, biggest, the two biggest and most important things. Thanks. Thanks for your questions, thanks for your engagement.